All right. Well, we are midway through Romans chapter 5. Um, and I, there's a chance that we might get into chapter 6, so we'll be ready for that, if that is the case. I do want to, though, begin, uh, just remind everybody our YBS starts on Friday. So Friday night, we'll be here, and for any of you who are interested in joining in, um, we are gearing this not only to the young crowd, it's going to be mainly geared towards the young crowd, it is called YBS after all, uh, not EBS for everyone, Bible, anyway, uh, but there are going to be special groups and uh, breakout sessions of discussions, uh, very specifically geared towards adults. And so if anybody desires to be a part of uh, the YBS experience on Saturday, you are more than welcome to join us at Whitaker on Saturday and all the information of what's taking place is on the flyers when everything will begin. So uh, just letting you know, you are more than welcome to be a part of it this year we're branching away just a little bit. I, I'm wanting to experiment and see how that works and uh, see if people enjoy that aspect moving forward. So, everybody remembers our YBS starts on Friday night, correct? You're invited to join us on Saturday, and hopefully you'll be here Sunday morning as we conclude. All right, so getting into Romans chapter 5. Um, we last week looked at the, the first portion of this. We've moved from his discussion about whom in chapter 4? Well, a Abraham, right? Uh, yeah, Abraham. And uh, who else gets a little nod as well? David. David. Abraham and David in chapter 4. And what is the, the whole purpose of bringing Abraham into the discussion? Okay, he's the father of the faithful. And one more really important aspect. All right, he predates the law of Moses. So uh, the time of Abraham, if Abraham is able to find justification before God, and he does so before the law of Moses is there, then does that mean that the law of Moses is necessary for that justification? No, justification does not come through works of the law of Moses. Um, and then he throws David in. David did live under the law of Moses, right? So why is his scenario important? All right, he had forgiveness of sins, which, according to the law of Moses, what should have happened to him? Death. He should have been executed because of the sins that were committed. But he received justification also, apparently, apart from the law of Moses. So we move into chapter 5, and he says, we've been justified by what? All right, by faith and not by works of the law of Moses, right? Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and then through him. And so we have this, this section, and, and we talked about all of that, um, and the idea that God came to us when we had made ourselves what? Against him? Uh, enemies? Yeah, I kind of gave it away, or I mean... Gave it away, you knew what I wanted anyway. We'd made ourselves enemies against him. We'd, uh, you know, by sinning, we'd set ourselves in opposition. And through Jesus, he has reconciled us. Verse 11, more than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've received reconciliation. Therefore, verse 12, we have another therefore, uh, not the last one. We have it in verse 1, now verse 12, therefore... Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, therefore death spread to all men, because all sinned. Um, so, now, if we're following his flow of thought, 
we talked about whom in chapter 4 again? Abraham, because he... All right, he, pre, he predates the law. What are we doing now? All right, now we're going back in time even more. If we're following Paul's timeline here, he's going back from the cross, and he, you know, he says, look, here's the law of Moses at you know, roughly 1500 or so, right? 1450, 1500. We go back to Abraham at 2100, and that's not even far enough. Let's go all the way back to Adam. And this is where everything first began. Now, he makes the point that from the time of Adam to the time that the law was given, what has been a constant problem? What's that, Ryan? Okay, that, that all have sinned. And very specifically, um, you know, he talks about, let's see here, verse 14 what reigned from Adam to Moses? Right, and death only is there if what? Okay, if there's sin, which means there has to be what? For sin to be... All right, there has to be a law. So his whole point is that there is a law that reigned from Adam all the way to Moses. So there is some kind of law that is in place. Now, he's not going to give us the particulars of this law just yet. He's going to hold that uh, back, and then he's going to get to it once we get to chapter 8. But what he's saying is that the law of Moses, was it God's first law that's given? No, it's just kind of dumped in there in a long string of things where you have Adam, Abraham, and, and others. Um, so he says death reigned between Adam and Moses. And by the way, this is assuming that you already know that from Moses to the cross has death still reigned. Yes. All right, so Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Did the law of Moses do anything about that situation? No. All right, death reigned from Adam, death reigned through here. So that this law also, whatever law this is that's under discussion, this law has reigned from Adam all the way to the time of Christ. This is the basic point that he's pulling out here that from the time of Adam, there was one man who what? What? Okay. Yeah, there, there was one man who sinned. He introduced sin. Let's just say he messed it all up. I mean, he just royally messed everything up. From his time onward, everybody is feeling the effects of the decision that he made. Does that make sense? That is Paul's argument, is that from this time on, he introduces sin, and sin continues to reign, because who sins? Everybody, death reign, you know, through one man sin into the world, death through sin, therefore death spread to all men because all sin. So sin and death enter right here. Sin and death enter right here, and they reign all the way through the time of Moses, right? All right. Uh, by the way, that wording is kind of important. Sin and death reigned. Right from Adam all the way through the time of Moses to Christ. When, well, now as Paul is bringing up, or at least the way that Paul is describing this, Jesus now becomes what, in Paul's estimation, a new Adam. All right, let's break down this idea then. If Jesus is now 
a new atom, what does atom represent? When you think of atom, what does atom represent? What's that, Ryan? Beginning. Uh, and, and I think that is, that's a really good word to use here. Um, what, what happens in the beginning? In the beginning, what? Creation. All right, atom represents a brand new created reality. That's what Adam represents, a, a blank slate kind of an idea that you have Adam who is placed here and he's given a provision by which his decision is going to affect everybody who will ever live, right? How do you do? Not well. All right, he messed it up. And therefore, he has messed it up for everybody who has ever lived. Now, enter a brand new Adam in the time of a brand new creation. Romans chapter 5 is a creation narrative concept. I mean, that's, that's what's taking place here. This is discussing the fact that at this moment, right here, there is a brand new creation concept because there is a brand new Adam, and he as well has the potential to, to make a decision that will what? Affect, or John just said, change the whole world, to affect everybody who has ever lived. Does that make sense? This is a comparison of two atoms. One atom, his decision, has affected everybody who's ever lived in a very negative way, which leads to what? Death. You know, this is, well, I already have D on here. I'll just go with that. It's all about death. The new atom is all about death. What about the new atom? If the old atom is all about death, what is the new atom all about? He is all about life. And so that's his, his argumentation. Um, and, well, we'll get to this in, in just a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap around and bring, bring in the idea of the free gift. But verse 18, uh, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. All right, that's our comparison point right here. Adam, disobedience, death to all men. Jesus is the new Adam, obedience and life. For whom? It's to all men, right? Yeah, I mean, it is important that we realize that these on the side of the equation, different sides of the equation, it's not like Adam affected everybody and Jesus just, just a very limited few. The reality of what Jesus has done is able to stretch out and affect every single person who has ever lived. That is the power. So that as far as sin spreads, and has sin spread pretty far? Absolutely. As far as sin spreads, what about the grace of God? It goes just as far, if not further, right? I mean, that's, that's the idea. It does. Goes, goes into, leads, you know, brings them into eternal life. And so you're supposed to see the failure of Adam and really the inability, the impotence of the law of Moses to take care of what Adam messed up, right? Is it able to? No. No act of obedience of the law of Moses is able to do what Jesus did on the cross. It's powerless. It, it cannot, in any way, shape, or form, affect sin and death. This can. And so as far as sin and death spread, the grace of God spreads just as far. Now, what is a phrase that keeps getting used 
when he talks about the grace of God here? Okay, yeah, uh, I'm gonna, yeah see, John, he does talk about righteousness here, but I'm going to go, I, I think Kevin, uh, you talked about the gift, right? The free gift of God. Um, this is a really important phrase here that he uses, um, well, he's using it in parallel with the act of righteousness, right? But he says, verse 15, uh, the free gift is not like the trespass. Verse 16, the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. Um, and then in verse uh, 17, he says, For if by one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign. So you see all of these words that he's tying, that he's, he's weaving together here. The idea of the free gift is the idea of the abundance of grace, is the idea of righteousness, um, and then justification and life. Um, so all of those things are tied together with the idea of the free gift. So now we ask the question, why is he stressing the free gift? That's going to carry us into chapter 6, uh, by the way, so if anybody has any questions or further comments on chapter 5 before we move on, now would be a good time to throw those out. Yeah, Vicki? All right, so what, what Vicki just said, we talk about how the law of Moses itself is powerless to deal with the law of sin and death, and, and she said that it was never designed to do that, um, which is the point that Paul's really going to start hammering home, especially in chapter 7. Uh, and once, once we get into chapter 7, that's going to be you know, chapter 7 into the beginning of chapter 8. That is his point. The problem, though, is that these Jewish Christians, what did they think about the law of Moses? Okay. Okay. And by the way, is it okay for them to keep the law of Moses after they become Christians? Yeah, it's well within their right to do so. If they felt that they needed to continue to follow the law of Moses, um, absolutely, they were able to. But I think what Jan's getting at here when she said they felt they needed to keep it, for what purpose, though? Yeah, that their salvation was dependent, or their justification, their relationship with God, was dependent upon their obedience to the law of Moses. And that if you had not um, stayed within the confines of the law of Moses, then you had made yourself unworthy to be considered for the messianic kingdom through Christ and salvation and all of that. But they would have thought that the law of Moses would have played a part in some way, shape, or form in your uh, justification and... Uh, that is really what Paul, the idea that Paul is trying to dismantle at this point in time before he's really going to, well, he's kind of building up the, the true at the same time. Yeah, Kevin? Uh, well, I guess along that thought, I, excuse me, had uh, taken this idea of gift mm -hmm. that they had believed that the law had been their gift. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so the idea here that Specifically, I guess, in verse 17, where the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So, the, back to this idea of the seed, back to the, the mm -hmm. gift really is Jesus Christ, not what you thought you had a, were the seed and had the gift from God being special in mm -hmm. just being you. That's not really where the gift was. That's not where the seed was. It's in Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and, and going from, from what you're saying, remember we talked about the idea, you mentioned the promise to, to Abraham, and uh, Kevin, you know, just a fantastic reminder to us that they thought they were that seed, that they were the fulfillment and through them. And, you know, Paul in Galatians and here in Romans is making it very clear, but especially in Galatians. In Galatians, I mean, he just point blank tells them, no, no, that's not a plural seed, y'all. It's a singular one. Jesus the Christ, and he is the one who is the answer. Um, and yeah, all of that is playing into this contrast here that the, the main players in the story of the fall and the return, who are the main players? Adam and Jesus. It's not whom? All right. It's not Moses. All right. He... He, he's a blip on the radar. And the law of Moses is a blip on the radar. It's an important one. It's a big one. It was part of God's process to get them to Christ, but he wasn't the end. He wasn't the point where the answer is given. Everything that's messed up in Adam is fixed in Jesus. That's what he's stressing. Now, moving into chapter 6, I want to start in a pretty weird place, probably. Um, and, and I don't know if we need to turn over there, because I think we probably have a good grasp on this. In, in Luke chapter 15, you have a, uh, a series of parables. And uh, does anybody remember what parables? There are three of them that you find in quick order in Luke chapter 15. Yeah, these are the lost parables. They're found now because we know where they are in Luke 15. Um, yeah, these, these are the parables of the, the lost sheep, the lost coins, and then the lost... Yeah, yeah, the lost sons. Um, and who can tell me just a real brief account of the, the uh, story of the wasteful son, the lost son, parable of the lost son? Go ahead, Ryan. So the son um, asks for his inheritance, and the father gives it to him, and he goes off and does his own thing, uh, spends, it, spends it all, ends up in a really bad situation, um, and comes to the re realization, what am I doing here? I'm, I should be home with my father. He comes back and um, from far off, his father sees him and comes running to him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he asks his father to be a servant in his household and, and his father puts a cloak on his shoulders and a ring on his hands and, and says, you're my son. And then the other son um, basically becomes jealous of him, and um, the father re rebukes the older son. So that's basically the story. All right, very good. Thank you. Everyone remember this parable? Yeah, you have these, you have these two sons. And uh, what's really interesting, and I think the most important son in this parable is which one? Right, it's the older son. Um, it says here, the older son was in the field. Uh, he came near the house, he heard the music, he heard the dancing, so he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. And he said, your brother is here. He told him, your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. So the older son became angry and did not want to go in. So his father came back and pleaded with him. Um, why, was, why was that older son angry? Yeah, 
Okay? So the, um, you said he, he has been doing the Father's will all this time? Okay, he's been, been a good son, he's doing what he's supposed to do, and um, he, does he receive the same treatment this younger son receives? Okay, he, he doesn't get a, what you say, a what? A, he doesn't get a party. Kathy, what were you going to say? He said you never did any of this for me. But the father said that I would have given it to you at any time. Yeah, I mean, you, he says, says look, I, I've been slaving many years for you. I have never disobeyed your orders. And yet you never gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who's devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him? Is there a sense in which he's got a point? What, is it, what does it seem like that the father is what? Okay, yeah, and, and you know, John, John just stressed, the father is the father. He gets to do what he wants to do. But let, let's take a step out, you know, without, without knowing the ending and how all of this is going to go and, and, and what the next phrase is. Let's just stop right here at this part of the story. What does it look like the father is doing right now? Okay, he's unfair, absolutely unfair, Okay, uh, can you come up, Mike, for Julia? Because I think this is the key. Say that again. He's, it looks like he's rewarding disobedience. Yeah, it looks to the older son as if the father is rewarding the younger son for his disobedience and wastefulness. He's like, are you kidding me right now? He's gone off and he's thrown away all your money. He's gone after prostitutes. He's done all of this. And now he's walking back and you're like, man, I'm really proud of you. Good job being wasteful. Let me give you a big reward for being such an awful, horrible person. Right? That's what it looks like, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that for this older son when he looks at it and says, you're going to give him? Him? All of that? That's ridiculous. That's stupid. That's the worst possible idea I have ever heard. Why? What about me? Right? You're rewarding disobedience. Let's go back to Romans chapter 6. How does Romans chapter 6 begin? All right, what shall we say then? Should we just keep on sending so that grace can abound, so that grace can increase? Of course not. This is the stress right here of that phrase back in chapter 5 that is going to permeate through, and it's going to end chapter 6. It's the idea of the free gift. See, when the Jews thought about righteousness, they thought about justification, they thought about their relationship with God, and if they did so in terms of the works of the law of Moses, what's the basis of this? What's the basis of them Maintaining the works of the law of Moses. Okay, yeah, that, that they are rewarded. They receive their due reward because they are a part of that covenant. Right? Because they are a part of this covenant, 
and they maintain their place in this covenant. They perform the correct ritualistic practices. You know, and, and don't get me wrong, this does not mean that they believed in meritorious deeds. I don't think that's the point of this. I don't think any Jew would have said, oh, I'm going to go out and do X, Y, and Z, so that way God owes me anything. I, I don't think any Jew would have ever believed that they're performing the works of the law with some kind of meritorious works, meritorious activity that purchased or earned their salvation, per se. Does everybody understand that? But what they did believe is that, generally speaking, just like that older son, if they maintained the proper relationship, they did the things that God asked them to do, they refrained from doing the things that God didn't want them to do, and they maintained their relationship with the Father, that in due time, the promise was given that they would get their reward, right? And then who else gets this reward? Those Gentiles. Now, they should only get the reward if they first become a part of this, right? How do they get their reward? Yeah, well, by what? It's not by being baptized, it's by... Huh? Yeah, it's the grace of God through faith. That's how they receive their reward, by the grace of God through faith. Now, I'm not discounting that baptism's a part of it at all. I'm, I'm not saying it's not. But baptism isn't, <laughs> you know, a, just another work of the law of Christ or something like that, right? You know, that, that we just tack it into. It is all 100% completely a system of grace, or, or yeah, uh, grace through faith. And it's just a, a part of that whole system. And so when Paul brings up his imaginary objector again, it's as if this imaginary objector is saying, Paul, what you're saying is ridiculous. You're saying a Gentile can come straight to Christ and he doesn't have to enter into the works of the law of Moses. He can just be Mr. Sinner out here and doing all this sinful Gentile stuff that all those Gentiles do all the time because they're a bunch of sinner, heathen people. Romans chapter 1, right? Amen to all of that if you're a Jew. Yeah, and they're doing, and then they could come straight to Jesus? It, it's as if you're rewarding them. You're rewarding them. And what's Paul's response? Is it a reward? It's a free gift. And I hope we can understand you know, what, what he's getting across, this idea of the free gift. Now, Ryan mentioned baptism just a second ago, and Paul brings that up right here in Romans chapter 6, uh, which is probably why Ryan brought it up, thinking that's where I was headed with it. Not quite you know, yet, but as you get into Romans chapter 6, are we to continue sinning so that God's grace can just go to anybody and everyone willy-nilly? He says, of course not. And, and by the way, I, th I think, I don't remember, did, have I talked about this uh, negation? I keep, uh, for some reason I'm thinking I kept saying, we'll, we'll talk about this once we get to Romans 6. This negation right here. You've seen Paul use it quite a number of times so far. I don't know, how, how, do, how do your translations Render this. Are we to continue to sin so that grace may abound? What does he say at the beginning of verse 2? Certainly not. Who has certainly not? A lot of y'all. Okay. All right. Who has something besides that? Kevin. I was counting on you to have something. But you know what, Kevin? Hold on. I'm going to save yours because yours is my favorite. Uh, so I'm going to hold that for just a second. Ryan, what do you have? By no means. Yes. And, and that's ESV. Is that, what the, is that what you're using? Oh, NIV. Okay, so ESV, NIV, they both use by no means. Let me see. Um, I really like the CSB. Absolutely not is what the CSB has there. Um, anybody else? 
besides Kevin have a different one? Yeah, Lorraine. Wait, hold on. Do you have King James? Okay, what do you have? Okay. Okay, may it never be. Yeah, New American Standard. All right, and then Kevin, I, I, I told you to hold on, but like I said, this is my favorite one. So I, what, what does yours say? God forbid. Now, did y'all notice any differences in those translations? May it never be, absolutely not, certainly not, um, by no means, yeah, you know, God forbid. Uh, if you're translating something, and by the way, you got two words here, how do you have so many different translations that have words that mean nothing alike? How can God forbid be a translation for this phrase when certainly not, or by no means, or whatever the case? Do you see the problem? I mean, a, a word means what it means, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> Dave said no. <laughs> just, just matter. Yeah, um, this phrase is it, it's it's a negation. You know, and y'all you know what I mean by negation. It, it's a phrase that says, "Hey, that last thing that I said, discount it." You know, it is not true, and it is such a strong negation. Um, that people feel, I mean, you can't just say, um, no, it won't be, or whatever the case, uh, no, it won't be, or trying to think how I would just do a, just word to word, but yeah, you, you don't just kind of take the words that are there and put it in there. You have to make people feel the force of this, not feel the force, but uh, feel just how strong this negation really is. Which is why I really like the King James Version uh, and how they treat this. By the way, I, I say it's my favorite. Absolutely not is the way that I would probably translate this. Absolutely not. Uh, or of course not. Maybe I would use that phrase. If we had the CSHV, it would be between those two. Absolutely not or of course not, one of those two. Um, but why would the King James use the phrase, God forbid? Okay. All right. So in 1611, that was a proper common language then. Mike? Yeah. Say that again. That's about as strong as you can get. Yeah. If God were to actually forbid something from happening, would it happen? No, couldn't happen. And so that's about as strong as you could make that negation. You know, should we continue to sin just so that grace can increase? <laughs> God forbid it. And if God forbids it, there's no way possible. Um, and so anytime that you see whatever that phrase, whatever it is in your particular translation going through Romans, that's what he's trying to get across. Is this just absolute, emphatic, there's no way possible that this is what God wants to happen. Or the, that Paul is saying that this is what I'm teaching. He is being, or people are saying, that the result of his viewpoint, and that is, once again, um, I, I guess I don't have something up here for it. I thought I did. The, the idea that God is rewarding sinfulness is what's behind this. So you're saying the more you sin, the better it is so that God's grace can show, well, why don't we just go sin willy-nilly then? Is that what you're saying, Paul? That it's okay just to go out and do anything and everything you want to? Because the more we sin, the more God can show his grace, right? If he wants to reward sinfulness, then we'd better get out there and sin all we can. Can you see what would cause them to say that phrase based on what we saw in chapter 5? And Paul says, no, that's not the point. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too 
might walk in newness of life. Why start talking about baptism here? First of all, let me ask this. Are we finally getting Paul's teaching on baptism? Is that what he's doing here, is teaching us what baptism is? Mike? Uh, I don't think so. I think he's assuming they already know. Yeah. Um, he, he's speaking to people, right, um, who have been, all of us who have been baptized. He's speaking from a, look, y'all remember this when you were baptized, right? This is the common understanding of what baptism is. He's not having to create some kind of new doctrinal concept of baptism. He's just saying, look, here's our common denominator we're going to work from. Um, Everybody in here, you can, you can see Paul saying, everybody in here has been baptized, right? What happened when you were baptized? You all know the picture. You, what? First you, you died to sin, then you were buried, and then raised up in a brand new life, brand new creation, right? He says, you all know this. What's the very first part? You die to sin. You can't continue to just live in sin after coming to Christ because you are supposed to die to sin. Now, this one, this is another phrase that I want you to tuck away. Uh, because this one's coming back out next chapter, and it's going to play a really important role in his argumentation in chapter 7. The idea of having died, that a death has indeed taken place. So he says, you've died to sin, you were buried with Christ, uh, so that you were raised with Christ. And he says, we understand that we have been united with him, in his death, and we've been united with him in his resurrection. Our old self was crucified so that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who's died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him, and we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die Again, death no longer has dominion over him. Uh, For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, and the life that he lives, he lives to God. All right, so you also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Everybody follow all of his... (laughs) wording through there. Um, it's really pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, we, y'all, I'm assuming we've been through this section of Romans before. We're fairly familiar with this. Um, what happens when we are baptized? We join in with his crucifixion, and we also join in with his what? All right, with his resurrection. Is he ever going to be crucified again? No. Therefore, do we need to put ourselves subject back to sin once again and be in need of coming out of that sin? Do we have to die to sin a second time? That's probably an easier way to say that. Yeah, you you see his point. A death to sin only happens once. Now, clearly that doesn't mean that you will never sin again, as the point is, but the death to sin has happened. The death that's a part of that where you join in with Jesus has happened. And what does that mean now? If you die with him, you must also what? Be raised with him. How was Jesus raised? Okay, never to die again, yes, but what else does he say? 
He lives a life. How, how does he live his resurrected life? The life that he lives, he lives to God. If we're going to join him in death to sin and experience the forgiveness of sins that comes from that so that sin is wiped out, we also have to join him in the resurrection from that death, and therefore, if he lives his life now to God, we also must now what? We must live our lives to God. Does that mean we go back to the sinfulness that we were a part of before? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's his point. And remember, when, when Paul gives his, when, when Paul's instructing, he instructs in the ideals. I mean, he's saying this is the way it should be. He doesn't get down often into the nitty-gritty and the caveats and the, well, of course, I mean, you realize this or that. He just says, this is the way it should be. And the way it should be is once we've died to sin and we are now raised, our lives are lived to God, never to go back to that sinfulness again. Does that make sense? And he's going to make it more clear once we get to the next section um, in which, you know, finishing up chapter, chapter 6, he's going to bring about another analogy from their day and time that will help us to understand our resurrected life as a life that is lived to God, not to sin. And by the way, all of this is also going to play a huge part once we get to chapter 8. Um, I know I keep saying that, but, but things, he's, he's just dropping things, talking about things, bringing things out, and then in chapter 8, it's all going to beautifully come together. Really looking forward to that. All right, um, questions on anything we've talked about? This evening, comments, anything? All right, this is a good stopping point, so we'll go ahead and close it up here. Thanks a lot, guys.